Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proofs to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on the Inside Analog Photo Radio Program, we're going to have with us Wyatt McSpadden. Wyatt is a cool photographer out of Austin, Texas. Did a great book called The Texas Barbecue. Beautiful commercial work. Lots of neat stuff that Wyatt's up to. And, of course, loving the use of film. Wyatt, how you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Scott. Hey, thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photography. Great to have you on the program to feature yourself and your work in just beautiful photography. Thank you. Great to be here. You've been doing some beautiful stuff here, Wyatt. Let's talk about what you're doing currently, and then we'll go back and see what you've been doing and all this other stuff. For the most part, I'm doing what I've been doing for the last 30-plus years. I'm a freelance assignment photographer. I do a mix of editorial, corporate advertising. I'm certainly experiencing some of the contraction in the economy and the media business right now. But we're hanging tough and looking forward to things getting better. So let's chat about how you got into photography. Have you always wanted to be a photographer? Have you well, always I, wanted to shoot? How did you get into photography? I grew up in a small town in the Texas Panhandle, Amarillo, Texas. And if you look at my website, there's a fair number of pictures of the Cadillac Ranch, which is a sculpture that was built outside of Amarillo by an art group called the Ant Farm out of San Francisco. And I was working for an eccentric millionaire in Amarillo by the name of Stanley Marsh III. Stanley always liked to have a photographer around. He had a bunch of kids. He was a wildly wealthy and eccentric character. I was taking pictures of the kids and taking pictures of parties and doing my normal duties driving the kids around, mowing the lawn, carrying out the trash. I was just a young high school graduate hippie there in Amarillo, Texas. And these guys blew in from California with this idea to create this sculpture, which was a monument to the American dream. They planted 10 Cadillacs nose down on the ground out on the west side of Amarillo. And the sculpture was an homage to the Cadillac tail fin. There were 10 Cadillacs. The first one was a 1949, which was the first year the Cadillac tail fin arrived. The last one was the 1964 Cadillac, which was the end of the tail fin era. And these crazy artists were in Amarillo buying used Cadillacs, 
digging holes out in the prairie and burying him nose down on the ground. And I was a young kid with a camera and a boss who bought all the film that I could use and provided me with a dark room and spent a bunch of time out there documenting that thing. Although I had an interest in photography, that project and that period of time got me really, really excited about it. In fact, I was talking to a class at the local community college last night and able to show some of the pictures of the Cadillac Ranch being built and buried. And of course, here it is almost 40 years since the thing was put in the ground and a lot of folks have never heard of it, never seen it. It's still kind of a fascinating thing and a great story to tell. No, it is great and it's amazing it's still there. Yeah, it is. And people stop out there on Interstate 40 every day and hike over to the Cadillacs. It's about a 100-yard walk from the highway and make a little pilgrimage to the Cadillac Ranch. So it was an important time for me. First of all, I was taking photographs of something that was all very peculiar and strange and something I'd never imagined. Then these guys from San Francisco, the ant farm, were a crazy, creative group of guys enthusiastic about the work they were doing and happy to have someone there to document it. Of course, they were doing the same thing, but they were happy for all the documentation that they could get. So it was a wonderful experience for me shooting my little Minolta SRT 101 and lots and lots of Triax. Where did your photography go from there? So you're shooting that deal, you document the Cadillac Ranch, what happened after Well, that? I continued to work for Stanley for a couple of years and then realized that had a limited scope of interest for me and I found a photography school that I could afford to go to in Sacramento. And I guess this was probably 1975. My then wife and I moved from Amarillo to Sacramento. I went to a photography school there called the Glenn Fishback School of Photography. And Glenn Fishback was a great classic California commercial photographer. He had ties to Edward Weston and Ansel Adams and Morley Bayer, the great architectural photographer. And Glenn taught his own variation on Ansel's zone system. He called it the value system, which sounds more like politics now than it uh, (laughs) does photography. But I went to school there at the Glenn Fishback School and learned about properly exposing film and developing it and pushing and pulling and trying to compress the range of tones. It was a very eye-opening experience for someone who was pretty much self-taught up to that point. And it was, for the most part, a trade school, but Glenn had aspirations as an artist himself, and he was a wonderful photographer. He was sort of an early practitioner of flash, sync, sunlight combination photography, fill flash, dominant fill flash, and did a lot of work for Kodak in the 50s when Kodak was doing lots of big promo posters and things like that. So I went through the school program there for a year and moved back to Amarillo started out as a freelance photographer, doing whatever I could do, whatever came in the door, product photography, corporate photography. It was a small town, small market, and I had a fairly narrow view of the world, but it was a good place for me to learn and a good place for me to make mistakes that weren't fatal to my career. Have you found that staying the whole time in Texas has helped or hampered you? Where a lot of people would think, okay, well, I'm going to go to New York now or L.A. Well, I never really had any ambitions about going to New York or L.A., and I think I have been very comfortable being a Texas photographer. And I think maybe Texas is one of the few places that you could actually attach that label to yourself and have it work. It's such a big state, and there's so much going on here, and it's so diverse. And from the cattle business and agriculture, state politics, and then the high-tech business, which has been very important here in the Austin area, I moved from Amarillo in 92 to Austin. Yeah, I don't have any complaints about that at all. I don't think I really would have been cut out to be a New York or an L.A. photographer. I like the pace here. I like the people, and I like the state. No, Texas is great, and like you said, it's huge. There's a ton of work there. I mean, why would you need to go anywhere else? Well, and the fact is is that a lot of work comes to you because you're in Texas, probably more than most other states. I mean, I know Texas has kind of a reputation as full of itself and arrogant, but there is a lot of stuff going on here. It's a great place to be for someone in my position. At this point, I'm working out of my home. Almost all the work that I do is location work. If I need a studio, I can certainly rent one. There's lots going on here, plenty to do. No, there is. So tell me about your love for film. I know you've been shooting film for many, many decades. You continue to shoot film, and of course, we'll chat about how digital has sort of creeped into the editorial environment just because of turnaround and time-wise, but I think uh, Die Hard, you're a film guy. Well, I've really hung pretty tough. You always hear about early adopters. I'm a very late adopter, latecomer to the digital world. 
but it sort of became a sink or swim proposition given the work that I do because so much of it is quick turn. And particularly in the last couple of years, since the sort of downturn in the magazine industry, budgets are a real critical factor. And it's hard to sell, first of all, the expensive film and the turnaround time for a lot of projects. But every chance I get to shoot on film, when I feel like now there's so many people that have adopted digital, that it's a real opportunity for you to stand out by actually shooting film just for all the reasons that we know that it has its own very unique quality and look. So I've hung tough for a very long time, shooting mostly for the editorial color work transparency film, Kodak, the ectochrome films, and black and white, typically Tri-X, processed here or at a local lab. It's such a different world now as far as how people produce images. And I still love film, and I like the fact you have to get it right in the camera. I was talking to these kids last night at the school, and in a way, I feel like when we were shooting film, we are really taking pictures, and now doing digitally, in a way, you're making them, creating them almost as much of it after you take the photo than it is where you were just tripping the shutter and developing film and then making the most beautiful print we can or making a proper exposure on a roll of transparency film. That's definitely the thing, and I think if you look at all these people that are doing digital and especially newcomers in photography, You have such a flexibility of adjustment. They're not really learning the core values of true photography when they're shooting digital entry. They can just like, I'll fix it in Photoshop. It's like, no, go shoot this roll of chrome and come back and show me. Yeah, exactly. Go expose it properly (laughs) and let's see what you got. There was an article in the New York Times earlier this week that sort of spoke to the trials of editorial photography. And one thing they mentioned, and of course we all know this, is that in some ways photography has become almost foolproof at a certain level. Because you know what you have before you leave. Right after you trip the shutter, you know what you have. And, of course, that's not how I came up, and that's not how most of us who were shooting film, you didn't really know until you processed your film. I was talking to these kids last night about, I mean, I can remember specific pictures that I had taken, and I can remember unrolling them off the spool and experiencing a tingle, a sense of excitement when I would see a frame that I knew was exactly what I set out to get. Well, I mean, that's the thing, and it's so cool when either you're souping your own film or you get it back from the lab and you open it up. It's a huge deal. Oh, it is. Absolutely. There's an excitement that I had for all of my career, an eagerness to see what you had. But there's no going back, particularly in the commercial and the editorial world. It's the ability to look and see what you shot immediately is like crack cocaine. (laughs) You can't, (laughs) once you get started, go back. I mean, I know that I've chastised myself when I'm doing a job with a digital camera for spending way too much time looking at the pictures that I just took instead of thinking about the pictures that I need to continue to take. It's very seductive. I think the digital goes and play with the film side by side if you use the digital as like a Polaroid. If it's that critical of a gig, okay, use it as a checker, then shoot the good stuff on film. Sure. But in your situation, though, is you have to charge clients more for film. I mean, you're not going to be able to eat all this. No, no, of course not. No, I mean, it does. It becomes a financial consideration. But I still have the sense that the pictures that I truly value, I mean, I always try to do the very best job that I can with whatever project, but you have to be realistic. Some photos that you take are going to have a life beyond the immediate, and some aren't. And it's the ones that you want to have an opportunity to have legs and to grow and to mature. Those are the ones that I want to put on film. We had a family get-together here this last weekend. It was my mom's 80th birthday. And I took portraits of the family gathering, which was a very unusual affair, and did it all on film, shot it all on Tri-X, medium format, because I know that stuff's going to be around. Yeah, that's the thing. We have these great digital cameras, and they are amazing with what they can do, and look what you can turn around editorial-wise and quick and all this kind of stuff. But just look at technology. I was going through my car the other day, and I had some CDs that I had made maybe three, four years ago. They wouldn't even play anymore. They just deteriorated and rotted. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I know that this stuff, if it's properly stored, it's going to be around for a long, long time. And perhaps all these thousands of digital files that I'm accumulating will be too. But I'm not positive about that. I don't know. The jury's still out. Well, at least with the digital stuff, you can send that file to DigiNeg and they'll burn it on film and store it for you. So you can turn your digital files into film and then at least you'll have it. I didn't even know about that. That's news to me. Yeah, it's about a dollar a frame, and you can send your key images off, and they'll actually use a film recorder like they use in Hollywood to put edited motion pictures back on film. Wow. They'll cook it on film, and they'll store it for like 10 years for the price. 
Or if you want, they'll just mail you a big strip of color neg or transparency. Here you go. And you keep it Amazing. yourself. I need to try that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, anything that's got legs, but like you said, you know what you want to keep, and you shot your family gig on Triax. Yeah, exactly, and it's like the barbecue book, which came out last year. It's a big deal for someone in my position at this stage of my career to be able to have a coffee table book, and it was something that I absolutely wanted to do on film. It was a very interesting exercise to shoot. I had an existing body of work, probably some pictures that were done about 10 years ago, all on 6x7, and when we made the contract with the publisher, I had to hit the road again and go shoot more of these little places. And I knew exactly how I wanted to do it. I wanted to shoot it exactly as I had the previous work. And it was refreshing for me to get out with the RZ and put it on a tripod and shoot, in some cases, maybe only shoot a single frame to get what I wanted instead of pushing the button on the D3 and going off for a smoke and then coming back and seeing how many thousands of frames (laughs) I've accumulated and then have to suffer through looking at them. Right, exactly. You know, with the RZ, you set the shot up and bang. It's a discipline. It's a sort of mental discipline and a physical exercise, too, to handle the camera and put it up. And certainly I've shot plenty of 4 by 5 back in the day, and this harkens back to that in some way. And it also seemed, in my mind, it respected the subject as well. I mean, the places that I was photographing and the topic is slow-cooked meats in old places, and it just seemed like the right way to do it. No, and I mean, the photography in this book is stunning. It's incredible. I mean, the way that you've been able to document, like you said, Texas barbecue, it just lends itself to film. It's a big deal around here. Oh, it is. It's huge. I mean, when I think of Texas, I think of barbecue, especially Austin. The best barbecue I think I've ever had was in Austin. Maybe Memphis, but it's close. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a longstanding debate. Who's got the best? But at any rate, that was a very deliberate decision to shoot the book on film. And I was thrilled that that's how we did it and thrilled with the results. And again, when the opportunities arise or it's personal work, then I'll get out the RZ. I've got a couple of old twin lens Roloflexes that I take on vacation and use those for our vacation photos. So you always have a camera with you, man, or where you go? Well, no, not always. No? Uh, no, <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> not when I go to lunch. So the Texas Barbecue Book, you shot this all on Chrome, all on Color Neg? Color Neg and then Plus X or uh, Tri X, depending on what the conditions were. Yeah, so it's a mix of color and black and white which is another one of the great pleasures of doing a book on your own and really not having to answer to an art director or a photo editor. If I went to a place and I didn't like the way it looked, I could just leave. I didn't have to stay and make a picture there. And if I saw something that, to me, was a black and white subject, that's how I would shoot it. Or if it was a color subject, I could do it that way. And as luck would have it or fate would have it, my wife is a great graphic designer, and she designed the book. So it was a wonderful collaborative effort between the two of us and lots of debates about which shots we should use and how they should be arranged. It was great fun to do. Do you find that because your wife was the art director slash graphic designer that it was easier to deal with or even harder if it was someone that you weren't connected to? I wouldn't say it's harder, but I also knew that I couldn't take anything to her that was half-baked. It had to be the best I could produce. Right. Or she was going to tell me about it. Well, I mean, she pushed you, I guess, to the limit, right? You had to give your best work. More than I want to please myself, I want to please her. Sure. Plus, you've got to watch out for Texas women on top of that. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> now, why, exactly. how did you figure when you were shooting the book that you said, okay, well, I want to have this shot in color and this one in black and white. What would tend you to grab a different back for the RZ? Well, I mean, we all experience that. Some subjects are black and white. Plus, I love black and white. I've always shot a lot of black and white. And in some ways, it's easier for me to see values and tones in black and white. But if you look at the book or what the pictures that are online, I think you would see that this is a color subject. This is a black and white subject. There's just a different sense of graphics in the subjects. So since you have this beautiful book on Texas barbecue, when you went to these places to shoot these guys, was everybody out laying out meat every time you showed up? Here, try some Uh, of this. (laughs) I didn't miss any meals, Scott. No? (laughs) No, 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 no. But that was also one of the great pleasures of it is that if you spend any time here, and particularly when you get out of the cities in the small towns, people are so friendly and accommodating here. Some of the places I had made arrangements in advance to go to, and then some I just dropped in. I'd be driving down the road and see a place that looked interesting to me and just stop in. And invariably, I was welcome regardless. Wow. And as much time as I needed to take, And if I needed someone to move a log or turn a brisket or something like that, people are always eager to help. So what's your thoughts here on your next gig? 
You going to do a new book? You have something cooking that's going to be different? Well, I don't really have anything in mind right now. This one's been out for a year. We've done a whole bunch of press for it and had a wonderful reception with signings and travel up to New York for some events up there. And I'm just trying to find the way forward right now, Scott. Like I say, it's a challenging time for the editorial business. Pages are down. So I'm looking. I'm looking to see what the next thing is. Well, I think with your involvement in what you've been doing, plus your love for film, you can carve out your niche and probably be able to capture a lot of stuff that other people can't to get a unique look and something different. Well, that sounds good to me, Scott. (laughs) I'll get after that. What else do you look forward to moving forward here? I mean, is there some other projects you'd like to shoot, something you haven't got to do yet that you really want to do? I'm an avid municipal golfer, and I haven't really taken advantage of that as a subject. There is some, I don't think it's on the website. I did do a story just recently, and it was really a personal project. There was a group of guys that travel around the country, and they play golf in vintage knickers and vintage clothing and hickory-shafted clubs and did a story on them, again, on my own, and then was able to sell it to one of the airline magazines. But I'd like to explore that topic a little more. Sort of the world of municipal golf, not the world of country club golf, but where the real people play. No, that would be a great, because like you said, you see all these books, like the story that Think Shot is all these really high-end, super over-the-top clubs. That's not where the people play. That's right. (laughs) I'm talking about about where people like me play. I can take my dog to the golf course. No, I think that would be a great photographic expose, a book even, would be really cool. That would be fun. Yeah, especially, like you said, you get some characters, and I'm sure there's plenty of characters. Uh, There's an endless (laughs) supply, Scott, absolutely. This is great stuff. So tell us here, Wyatt, what's the best way to look at your work to get a hold of you? People can check out what you're doing, either for editorial work, look at the barbecue book. The book Uh, is over the top. This stuff is great. Thank you so much. It's wyattmcspadden.com, and that's W-Y-A-T-T-M-C-S-P-A-D-D-E-N.com. And there's a link there to the book, certainly email address and telephone. That's the best way to get it done. Yeah, this is great stuff, Wyatt. I really appreciate you joining today. This is beautiful work, and you definitely have done Texas Proud. Thank you very much, Scott. It's a pleasure to do this. Well, there you go. Wyatt McSpadden. Great stuff. Beautiful photography. Very cool guy. Definitely want to check his book out, Texas Barbecue, and, of course, his website. There's images up there. There's videos, his commercial work. Check out his website at www. W-Y-A-T-T-M-C-S-P-A-D-D-E-N dot com. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film. And of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development over at www photopublicist.com our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country richardphotolab.com our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at dr5.com upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com and of course our media partners of the analog photography user group at apug.org and our official philanthropic partner George Eastman House over at eastmanhouse.org I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.